So thanks to your questions in my no need sourdough bread video, today I'm gonna to break it down for you. I've trawled through all of the comments to find the most popular questions and get those answered. And I've got a little apology to make too, but we'll get onto that in the video. Now, some of these points I'm gonna break down further in future videos. So if that's of interest, then click subscribe, click that bell and stay tuned. Okay, so a basic no need sourdough bread. And at the end, I'm gonna show you two ways to cook it. First way on a baking stone with a cloche over the top and the second way directly on the oven shelf using a spray water bottle. Okay, and straight into it. And if you've got any questions at all, please leave them in the comments and I will get back to you. So into our mixing bowl, we've got 247 grams of water and 12 grams of sea salt. Now don't worry about adding the salt before we add our starter. It's not gonna be a problem. It's not gonna kill the starter. You just wanna make sure that that salt is well dissolved in the water. Now, quite rightly so, I had lots of people saying, hang on a minute, Philip, salt does kill the starter and it does kill yeast. That's actually not the case. In the small percentages that we use salt in baking, it doesn't kill our starter and it doesn't kill the yeast. But it does do two really cool things. It slows the fermentation period down and it strengthens our dough. Both really cool for all bread baking, but especially for no need recipes. Now we've got 128 grams of starter going in. I fed this last night. Um, so it's been sitting out on the counter for about 12 hours and it was fed at a one to one to one ratio. So we've got 100% hydrated uh, starter going into the bowl. Okay, so quite rightly, many of you asked, what is a starter? Now a starter is just a fermentation of flour and water. Once that's fermented, we then use it as a leavening agent to make our main dough. But what's a one to one to one ratio? That refers to the way that we feed our starter. We take one part of our starter, for example, 50 grams. We take one part water, 50 grams, and one part flour, 50 grams. And they're mixed together and then the starter ferments. But what's good about this as well is that we know that the starter is 100% hydrated, which helps us if we need to calculate water content for the recipes. But I should also mention that there are many different ratios and ways of feeding your starter, but I just picked this one for this recipe. So obviously this has been set out for some time and the gluten network has had a chance to develop. So it's going to take a bit of effort, just keep stirring until you've managed to dissolve the starter all the way through the water. Now I know some of you commented and said you had a problem dissolving the starter completely in the water. Now if there's a few clumps left, that doesn't matter. They're gonna break down during the fermentation process. But interestingly, some of you commented and said that you added the starter to the water and then added the salt. And that way you didn't get any clumps at all. So that could well be one to try and thank you. And now I'm adding 375 grams of plain, bulk standard, off the shelf, all purpose, white wheat flour. This isn't organic, it's not a speciality grain. You know, the purpose of this is to demonstrate that you can bake a basic loaf of bread using basic ingredients. Now you can use whatever flour you want, but I wanna take it back to its basic format just to demonstrate what's possible with easily accessible things. Okay, so I'm gonna pull my foot out of my mouth right now and say sorry. What I neglected to mention was that my flour, which is an all-purpose flour made by Robin Hood, has a protein content of 13.2%. And of course, I appreciate that most all-purpose flours don't have that. Now I did go back and I put up a pinned comment and adjusted the video description to reflect that, but of course I understand that's easily missed. So I wanted to say sorry, and dive a bit deeper into the importance of protein in the flour. Okay, so for a no need bread, we want time to develop our gluten. Now that gluten network is really important because it creates like a web and that web traps the gas inside during the fermentation process. And that's what gives us a really nice open crumb and a tall loaf. So gluten is formed when the two native proteins in wheat flour, glutenin and gliadin, come into contact with water. Now, the more time they spend in contact with the water and the more time the dough ferments, the more complex that gluten development becomes, which is great for trapping those gases. Now, Modernist Cuisine has got a fantastic article on this and I will link to that in the description. So the amount of protein in the flour will directly impact on the gluten that we can build in the dough. So shooting for a flour with a protein content of 12 or 14% is excellent, but 
Just remember, whole wheat flour can also have a high protein content, but the retained bran and germ in that flour actually takes some of the hydration away from the proteins, causing a weaker gluten structure. So you might not get as much spring or open crumb texture. But in my opinion, that's not necessarily a bad thing at all, because what you might lose in high or oven spring, you are definitely going to gain in flavour and nutrition. So in summary, if you're shooting for the most open crumb loaf you can possibly get with a great ear and stuff like that, you can go for a really good strong bread flour with a protein content of 12, 13 percent but if you're willing to forego just a bit of that spring and open crumb texture then use a whole wheat flour because you're going to gain on flavor and you're going to get that nutritious element as well now i've got a video where i use a 50 50 blend i'll link to that above and in the video description and remember this is a no knead bread so no kneading literally we're just going to use our hand like a claw and we're going to bring the flour the water and the starter together into kind of a rough shaggy mess it's funny when i was filming this and even more so when i was editing i knew i was going to get some stick for kneading this so i'm going to stand by this this is definitely still a no knead bread all i'm doing here is incorporating the ingredients really well just try and clean the bowl around a little bit as you go but the purpose here isn't to knead it's just to bring the ingredients together and this is what you'll be left with a bit of a shaggy mess get that back into a bowl we'll cover it up with a plastic so if your dough's too sticky, we need to look back at the flour. So the type of wheat, the way it's been refined, its absorption capabilities, the way it's been stored, will all impact on the amount of water that flour is able to take on board. So you just need to remember that different flours will absorb different rates of water. So what happens if you start baking a recipe and your dough's too sticky? Well, you could adjust as you go along by, for example, adding more flour but for me I prefer to finish that bake if I possibly can and then once the bread's baked I like to evaluate what's happened make some notes and then adjust the recipe on the next bake and then we'll just leave it out on the surface at room temperature for about an hour or two and here's the dough after that period doesn't really look any different does it it's only when you touch this that you're gonna realize what's changed and all of that flour has had time to be hydrated by the water. We haven't had to do that by muscle power. It's just happened over time, which is what makes this a fantastic no need bread. Now you can just push it out into a rough rectangle, a rough square, and then just pull the sides in on each other and form it into kind of one mass. And then don't add any flour. Resist the urge to use flour. Use that stickiness to your benefit, to your favor, and just gently turn that round and round. And what that's gonna do is, as it sticks slightly to the bench, so I prefer not to use flour on my bench. I like that contact, that stickiness between the dough and the bench. I find it helps with shaping. But of course, if you're struggling and you find that difficult, you could use a touch of flour or you could use a spray water bottle and use a fine mist of water. But in either case, don't use too much, use it sparingly. It's gonna build the surface tension of the dough and it's gonna give us a really nice tight ball that's manageable and easy to work with. And then we're just gonna pop that into our bowl we're going to cover it up again and we're going to leave this to bulk proof now probably for about four or five hours but that's going to be dependent on the temperature in your kitchen you know my kitchen is super hot it's summertime it's 32 33 34 35 degrees what do i do so we're making a no need bread and as we've mentioned a few times during this video we need time to allow that gluten to develop so if the temperature is too hot, that fermentation is going to happen too quickly and we run the risk of the dough overproofing. And when it overproofs, we end up again with a sticky mess, which we really want to avoid. So you need to find a way to slow down that fermentation period. And one way you can do it is to bring the main dough together and then leave it out at room temperature to start fermenting, maybe for 30 minutes or for an hour. And then you can pop that dough well covered into the fridge to finish its proving. But beware, if your fridge is very cold, then that 
proving it's going to slow right down and it's going to take a long time to ferment. Now one solution to this, it's one that I like to use, is to use a large cool box. I've got a big cool box and I throw a couple of big ice bricks in there and what that does is it lowers the temperature down but it doesn't take it as cold as a fridge which means the fermentation process slows but it still goes relatively quickly and I'm not waiting a long time. This is what the dough looked like after about five and a half hours sitting out on my work surface. And the next stage is to get this into a shape to go into our proofing basket. Now we've just spent a lot of time that we've invested into adding gas to this dough. So the key is to be really, really gentle here. We don't want to lose all of that air from this dough. And again, no flour on the bench whatsoever. So how do we know when the dough's ready, it's fermented, it's proved and we're ready to move on to the next stage? This is going to take some experience and you're going to have to practice. What we're looking for is a dough that has risen appreciably but probably not doubled in size. You're going to go too far. So you want to touch it and you want to feel it and you'll feel the gases that have developed inside. The dough still needs to feel strong like it's trapping those gases in. When you push down on it the dough is going to depress and then it's slowly going to give back. As I said experience is key here and you will get used to it but one bit of advice I will give you is if you're unsure err on the side of underproving as opposed to overproving your dough. I've pushed this out into a rough rectangle and then I'm just gently folding over the sides. It's really important to work with light fingers with light hands here. You're going to feel how springy the dough is and as you're doing it you just want to maintain that. After you've folded all of the sides over we're going to leave this sitting just for two or three minutes while we dust our banneton. I'm making sure that I get the flour in all of the gaps between the ridges on this basket. It's really important that this is dusted well. We don't want that dough to stick. Okay, you asked what flour do I use to dust my banneton? I use the same flour that I'm baking with. Now, if I'm baking a whole wheat loaf, I might use whole wheat flour as well. But I know a lot of you out there suggested using rice flour because there's less chance of the dough sticking, so that's one to try as well. And if you haven't got a basket, check out my video above, I'll link to them in the description as well, where I show you how to use a bowl, a tea towel with flour, or pegs, you can use clothes pegs, to actually make your own proving basket. Use more flour than you need to, we can brush it off afterwards, and then I like to use my finger just to push all of the flour into the gaps and make sure that I've got every single base covered. Final shape now for this dough. Flip it over and we need to roll this into a rough shape that's going to match the shape of the basket. So I'm just gently pulling it out. Again, we don't want to lose any of that air and I'm going to roll it up into a sausage and as I roll it, I'm gently pushing forward to form a little bit of a seal. And again, however you get this done, it doesn't matter. There is no specific way. You're just basically looking for a long, thick, sausage shape that's going to fit in that basket. Liberally dust the top of this because we're going to turn it over and the top of this is going to become the bottom. So again we're just adding some more flour just to make sure it doesn't stick and then using a bench scraper I'm just going to work around the outside again just to make sure it releases from the work surface easily and then just roll it over. Gently into the banneton, cover it up and then leave it to prove at room temperature for a couple of hours and this is what it's going to look like. Again it hasn't doubled in size, we're not looking for that, we're looking for something that's grown but still retains some energy so that when we put it into the oven we get some real oven spring. So make sure you release the dough from the outside, I like to give it a good dusting of flour and then a swift sharp tap onto the peel and then brush off any of that excess flour. And here you can see the dough really hasn't overproved. Even though I've banged it out and it's gone out onto the peel, you can see that it's still holding shape well. And that's exactly what we want because when we put it into the oven, that's when we're going to get the spring. And you're going to see it in a minute. When I cut the dough open with the blade, it doesn't all fall apart. And here's the line I'm going to take with the lame. I'm going to cut into the dough confidently, but not too deeply. And that's going to allow it to expand in the oven to the shape we want. The oven's been preheated to 250 degrees Celsius. I'm going to put a cloche on it. It's going to cook at that for the first 20 minutes and then I'm going to reduce the temperature to 220 Celsius. I'm going to take off that cloche and here you can see 
how much oven spring has happened here. So here you can see popping the pot over the top is great because you create this little microclimate for the dough. When it first goes into the oven, it stays nice and moist, it hits that baking stone and the heat transfers and we get this really nice oven spring. And on another note, a lot of you asked, where did I get that baking stone or what is it? I was actually given that when I was cooking in Italy and it's a piece of lava from Mount Etna. And it is hands down the best baking stone I had and it got broken in my most uh, recent apartment move. So I'm currently looking for another one. I've tested a couple, but none of them live up to this. But when I find the right one, you guys will know and I'll do a little video on it. And that cut has allowed that bread to open beautifully. This is now gonna bake for a further 20 minutes. And here you can see the final result. Now the golden color for me is perfect. Some people like a darker exterior. In that case, just leave it in the oven for a little bit longer. Overall, I'm really happy for this bake. A basic, simple sourdough bread with great structure, great shape. It's lovely and crispy on the outside and a great crumb on the inside. But what happens if you... So I love this sourdough bread, I love the recipe, and I think for a beginner's bread, it's really, really good. Yes, there's more steps you could add, without a shadow of a doubt, and possibly they'll even improve the loaf, but I think for a basic beginner's bread, you can't really go wrong with something like this. It's a great introduction to sourdough baking. So I will link to the full video in the description, and if you guys have baked with this, let me know what the results were, good or bad. It's great to keep up with what you've been doing. But for now, I wanna say a huge thank you for watching. I really hoped this helped. I'll see you again very soon. Stay tuned.